it about about time. Welcome all of you to the first of our fall series of uh, reflections. Yeah, they kind of blend with winter and summer, but <laughs> <laughs> a few months back, when they finally turned us loose to get out and about, I was making a stroll around campus and. Up, uh, nice afternoon, sun was out. Up on the porch was uh, Preston and, of course, Grover, and they were just taking the afternoon sun. Well, in fact, I think both of them might have been taking the afternoon nap. <laughs> well, being a relatively newbie to Brandon Oaks at that time, I had not met Preston, but I knew that anybody married to the fireball Sharon had to be a good guy. So I, so I just walked up and introduced myself. A couple of chairs down in here, folks. So I, I introduced myself, and being his ever-gracious host, Preston invited me to have a seat, and Grover condescended to letting me scratch his back. We had a grand visit. We talked about stuff all the way from uh, coal fields in West Virginia to Floyd County House Restoration onto uh, pediatric professorships. I was really totally impressed with my new friend, and I probably overstayed my welcome. However, the one topic that afternoon that really piqued my interest was Preston's involvement in a program to preserve the Madagascar lemur. Well, who would have thought? I had only a minute knowledge of lemurs myself, which was kind of akin to the beautiful little babies you see up on the screen. Well, Preston's growth in his profession and his commitment to the lemurs is a worthy and most interesting reflection. And I would like to say one thing. I sent a copy of this slide to my granddaughter, and she wants two of them for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so Preston's going to answer the question for us about what is the real lure of the lemurs? Thank you. I don't know whether, can you hear me? I don't know. It's, it's on. It's on. Okay. Okay. Well, all my buddies came. So, um, the, um, this is uh, not only an honor, but uh, a uh, blessing uh, knowing uh, Buster and uh, the things that have led up to this afternoon. Um, thank you all for coming. And um, as I get started, uh, I want you to realize that uh, I would love to be interrupted with questions at any moment. So uh, don't, don't hesitate to raise a hand and, or just shout, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, the um, story is more than the lure of the lemurs. It's uh, the lure of nature. And uh, from my standpoint, uh, it has been uh, an, uh, a wonderful life. I grew up in the coal fields of uh, north central West Virginia. And uh, although we lived in a town, uh, our uh, property uh, was uh, bordered on the backside uh, by a forest uh, called... Uh, the Coal Run Forest. 
and uh, there was a city um, built uh, children's playground just across the road uh, with swings and ball fields and things like that. And um, all the kids in the neighborhood, well, not all of them, but most of the kids in the neighborhood spent all their spare time in the um, playground. Um, I was uh, much more tempted to um, uh, go out in my backyard and walk into the forest and spend time uh, looking at uh, natural things there. Um, and although I had absolutely no idea at that stage of the game what a lemur was, um, I knew about butterflies and snakes and things of that sort. And um, my uh, parents knew my love for, for animals. And uh, so f when I was fairly young, they uh, set me up with goldfish in my, uh, uh, in my uh, bedroom. And uh, then I graduated to tropical fish. And um, at one point along the, the line, the uh, tropical fish uh, sort of died away. And I was left with several aquariums in my uh, bedroom and um, was wondering what I should do with them. And my parents were wondering what I should do with them. And um, so uh, I decided that it would be a wonderful place uh, to have a snake collection, uh, which, which happened. Um, and uh, none of them were poisonous, uh, but it was uh, a favorite meeting spot, uh, not only for children, but for adults in our neighborhood. And um, one thing led to another, and uh, I uh, went through, uh, went, went on to the school and uh, graduated, and um, my parents decided that uh, uh, although they had gone to West Virginia University and all of my uh, close friends in high school were going to West Virginia University, they decided that um, it would be better if I at least applied to uh, some of the schools up in the Northeast. And uh, I remember one day walking home from school, my dad was standing out on the front porch waving a white envelope in his hand, and um, it was my acceptance uh, to a university in uh, Connecticut called Yale. <laughs> and um, I told Dad I really wasn't going to go there. Um, I wanted to go to West Virginia. And uh, he said, uh, how are you going to pay for it? <laughs> and uh, I... Uh, very quickly uh, said, well, I didn't think I was quite prepared uh, to go uh, to that school. And he said, well, I think you can. He said, it's very easy to spell. <laughs> and um, one thing led to another, and of course, that's where I ended up. Um, my first day there, um, I got interviewed by um, a uh, an associate in the education department, and uh, they wanted to know my history and things about me uh, personally and what I should end up studying uh, while I was there. And um, they were very surprised uh, that I didn't uh, want to do a, a, a major in mathematics because on the SAT set, test, I had gotten a perfect school score in math. And uh, I told him, no, that uh, uh, biology or zoology was going to be my favorite. And as it turned out, that worked out pretty well. And uh, very soon, um, I um, got a job in the primate laboratory, uh, taking care of uh, some monkeys and 
but, but a large number of lemurs which had been collected uh, at Yale. And uh, so, and that's how I paid for part of my uh, um, edu college education was just working in, uh, working in the primate lab. Anyway, came time to graduate and uh, my professor and uh, advisor, um, who was a zoologist, um, said, would I like to have a grant uh, and go study lemurs uh, when I got through college? And I said, sure, I didn't have anything else in mind. And um, so the day of graduation, I left uh, on a flight for uh, Nairobi, Kenya, and from there uh, went to uh, an island just off the east coast of Africa called Madagascar. Um, it was quite an experience. This was in 1962, and up until 1960, uh, the French had controlled the island uh, for a number of years and would not grant uh, admission of Americans or British, uh, plus a few other selected uh, European countries, uh, to enter Madagascar. So it was only after 1960 when the native uh, population gained control of the government that they then began to allow Americans and other countries to enter and uh, uh, visit, study, and whatever. So it turned out I was one of the first Americans uh, to ever get on the Madagascar in at least the 20th century. Um, and uh, one thing led to another uh, very quickly. I got a Land Rover and uh, started touring the island. The island is one of the largest islands uh, in the world. It's a thousand miles long and about 200, averages about 200 miles in width. And uh, nobody, there were very few Americans there. We, the Americans had just established an American embassy there. And uh, that was my contact with reality because uh, the Americans uh, spoke English. And um, the, uh, well, one of the, one of the beauties of, uh, of having had the French uh, on the island for a number of years was that the French ran uh, schools for the children and the schools were all operated in French language. So whenever I went to a village, um, I would be the only European there, uh, but, and the only European uh, that spoke a European language that the children could uh, understand. So when I'd go to a village, uh, I wouldn't go to the community leaders uh, to get information. I'd go to the children. And because uh, I spoke I spoke French, I spoke a little French when I went. Uh, but amazingly enough, my French got better as the year went on. And uh, it uh, worked out very well. Well, um, long story short, uh, as far as the year in Madagascar was concerned, was I was totally by myself the whole year. Uh, driving, going through, learning where different uh, species, not only of lemurs, but other animals existed. And since Americans had not been allowed to be on the island, um, it was uh, suddenly opened up uh, for uh, American, uh, not only scientists, but publishers. And uh, so, and I was uh, one of the few Americans on the island at the time. And uh, so, and I knew, got to know the island fairly quickly because I was 
driving all around and finding lemurs, but also finding a bunch of, bunch of other stuff too. And um, so as it turned out, I uh, got to chauffeur around um, a few important people uh, from uh, National Geographic, uh, Life Magazine, and uh, uh, several other publications uh, well known in this country. And um, it was exciting, but it wasn't nearly as exciting as observing the animals, and specifically the lemurs. Um, so I spent the year um, driving the island, uh, keeping notes about uh, different species in different places. And uh, at the end of the year, it was time to leave. My grant was running out. And um, my uh, parents had, uh, in uh, my absence, uh, made uh, some applications to some, a couple of medical schools in this country, uh, always looking out for me, of course. And uh, so while I was in, uh, while I was in Madagascar, uh, I got a notification that I'd been accepted at Duke Medical School. And uh, Dad reminded me again that uh, just as Yale had been easy to spell, uh, Duke was easy to spell. Um, and uh, that sort of uh, sealed the deal. Um, so, came back and uh, went uh, to Durham, North Carolina, and uh, got started down there. Um, and the first year of medical school is sort of like it's an extension of college. Uh, it's basically all classrooms uh, where you sit and uh, listen to a speaker and watch slide slide presentations and things of that sort. And um, my first year, one of my hardest classes was biochemistry. And I was sitting in my biochem class one day, and the dean of the medical school uh, came to the door of the class and said, is Preston Bogus in here? And, uh, the professor shook his head yes and pointed at me and I sheepishly raised my hand wondering what in the world have I done now? And he said, come on out in the hall, I wanna to talk to you. So I went out and uh, got ready for the worst and it turned out to be the best. Um, he, said, I he said he understood that uh, I had worked for a professor at Yale uh, who was a primatologist, that is a specialist in primate biology. And he said, we want him to come to the medical school and join our anatomy department. Do you think he'd be interested? And I said, well, I don't really know, but I'll give him a call. So that night I called my professor at Yale and invited him uh, to come on down and visit. And uh, long story short, he did come, was accepted and he accepted. And he, when he transferred from New Haven to Durham, he brought all of our lemurs from New Haven and we started the Duke Lemur Center. The Duke Lemur Center, five years ago, celebrated its 50th anniversary, and Sharon and I went uh, to visit, and uh, it hadn't changed a whole lot since I was there, um, but uh, it has uh, the most diverse collection of lemurs anywhere else in the world except Madagascar. Um, and it's uh, intensely, it's, uh, it is not only indoor cages and things of that sort, 
but an outdoor expanse of forest. It started at 50 acres and is now 100 acres of forest. And in the um, spring or early summer, uh, the lemurs are, uh, a large number of them actually, are released into the forest. And so that during the summer, or the warm months, you can observe lemurs in what uh, is fairly close to what their natural uh, uh, country was like. Um, and uh, so it's now the leading uh, center for um, lemur um, science, at least in this country, and I think probably pretty much in the whole world at this point. Um, the um, um, other goal is conservation uh, in Madagascar. Um, there are um, roughly 100 species of lemurs um, in uh, the world at this point. And um, we have, uh, um, I think, close to 50, 50 of them. Uh, Sharon's going to ch check on me here uh, in Durham. And um, the uh, um, fifteen of the species. Um, it uh, lemurs are the most endangered mammalian uh, species anywhere in the world at this point. Um, one third of uh, all. Uh, lemurs have uh, become extinct in the last uh, uh, 25 years. And uh, one of the biggest problems, of course, um, is that uh, Madagascar, which is where they had evolved from 65 million years ago, and in evolution, uh, they preceded monkeys and apes. Um, the um, main uh, uh, concern, of course, at this point, because the extinction uh, process is continuing uh, and really st started uh, about 2,000 years ago when human beings first came to Madagascar. Up to that point, uh, they evolved freely. Uh, one of the exam one of the reasons, or several of the reasons for that, uh, is that Madagascar has no cats, no lions, no tigers, so there were no large mammals uh, to kill off lemurs, and there are no poisonous snakes in Madagascar. Um, Lemurs were at one point pretty much scattered uh, throughout the world. Um, and uh, of course, because of no lemurs and no cats or uh, other uh, killers, uh, they were allowed by nature to evolve only in Madagascar. Uh, there's some fossil evidence of uh, lemurs uh, in Canada and also here in the United States. Uh, but that it's very, very tiny numbers and uh, not, uh, not well studied. Um, but at any rate, uh, it uh, has been a fascinating place to go and a fascinating place to come back from. I uh, was able to smuggle some lemurs back when I came. They, there are big ones and there are little ones. Uh, the little ones are called mouse lemurs. And uh, I could, I brought back three in a uh, cloth bag around my, uh, strapped around my waist. Um, and um, 
I, one of the other things that I brought back uh, in another strapped bag um, was a boa constrictor. Um, I, I don't talk much about that. Uh, but in besides just looking at uh, lemurs and uh, getting information back on those, I had one of my jobs in Madagascar uh, was to uh, collect boa constrictors for the San Diego Zoo. Um, and uh, we had a system uh, work through the uh, um, uh, through the US uh, government attachment that would allow me to ship them uh, back to this country. Uh, and I brought one back. Uh, it was, his name was Fred. And um, he, he was uh, my, one of my favorite buddies. Uh, well, he was very essential because um, when I would be traveling in my Land Rover uh, and living out of a tent, which I did most of the year and almost always by myself, um, I would have to leave my Land Rover in my tent alone during the day when I went out to find lemurs and other animals. And the natives, I was afraid, would uh, come in and uh, swipe things from my Land Rover and tent. Well, as it turns out, uh, the natives believe that boa constrictors are reincarnations of their forebears, human, their for human bear, their human forebears. And so what I did was I rigged up a, a, a sort of a trapeze arrangement in my Land Rover uh, and uh, uh, got a boa constrictor, turned out to be Fred, and I would leave him plain in plain view inside my Land Rover all day long while I was gone. And of course, the natives wouldn't come near. The, so anyway, um, and I have some really nice pictures of Fred and around my neck and uh, other, but we didn't show, we're not showing those today. Um, the, um, um, well, why don't, well, Buster's got some pictures of some of the different types of, la of uh, lemurs and uh, they, they're both nocturnal forms and diurnal forms. Um, and um, one of the things that's really unique about them as primates is that from a social standpoint, uh, they are, um, their little tribes of lemurs are run by women, by female, uh, <laughs> female lemurs. Um, and uh, all other monkeys and apes uh, are operated uh, by male uh, members of the, the, the group. Um, so, the, and as we're, we're learning here at Brandon Oaks, uh, that uh, characteristic uh, is, has been passed on. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> at any rate, um, any questions? Can you tell us how tall this guy is? <laughs> Talk about the tallest one. Oh, the tallest ones when they stand on their uh, hind legs. And the next, next couple ones, uh, some of these, uh, and you can see, um, some of them will stand uh, probably close to four feet. Um, the uh, mouse lemurs are quite small, and uh, they weigh uh, less than a pound, or some of them do. Um, the largest lemur um, I, is, uh, weighs about 50 pounds, and strangely enough, that lemur 
that does not have a tail. Um, and um, he also does not survive in zoos. Uh, we have sent uh, several to several zoos here in the United States, and uh, they all die usually within a year. Um, whereas uh, the standard kind of ones that we sent, um, Well, yeah, the black one. The black. Yeah. This one is a black, blue-eyed lemur, and it's, it's, it's almost extinct. And Preston adopted it, and its name is Presley. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if, if anybody has any questions, by the way, oh, yes. Did I misunderstand you when you said there were no cats and no snakes on the island? No poisonous snakes. Oh, poisonous. Poisonous oh, okay. snakes on the island. But, but, so but you don't boa constrictors are not poisonous. They're not poisonous. No. Okay. They squeeze you to death. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> They're friendly. Yes, yes. <laughs> Preston, I got a question. You're saying they're becoming extinct. What's the reproductive period for these, if and when there are? How long does it take for them to, to reproduce? Oh, golly, it's fairly short. Is it? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I think, probably two to three or four months, depending upon the, the particular species. Okay. And do they have multiples or just singles? Yes. They yes. do have multiples. Okay. Yes. I'm curious. Absolutely, yes. So are lemurs friendly to people? Will um, they scratch and bite? They don't scratch and bite. They run away. Um, and, uh, but they can be friendly, and especially if they're around, well, at, especially at places like the Duke Lemur Center, where they're around human beings all the time, uh, they get a, a lot closer. Um, I don't, I, I don't picture them as being snuggly, uh, but, uh, but, they're, uh, but they're at least, they allow you to pet them and that sort of thing. What do they primarily provide to the community as they leave? I'm sorry, as they... As, it, as they're taken away, what, what's missing when they're gone? Why are you working to preserve them, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Oh, because um, civilization, as, in, as we know it on Mad in Madagascar, is, has eliminated their natural habitat and their natural food. And so they're v v rapidly becoming extinct. Oh, well, the harm of the harm of extinction is uh, is loss, uh, and uh, there, uh, if if they had been extinct, I wouldn't be sitting here today. <laughs> uh, are there still lemurs in Durham, and have so how many? Oh yes, there. Close to a hundred. How many? Close to a hundred at the Duke Lemur Center. I just wanted to add, going back to that last question, because lemurs are more like us than any other animal. Um, they're more like us than chimps that a lot of uh, research has been done with. They're more like us certainly than mice, which a lot of research has been done with. So when Preston and I went five years ago, there were three days of lectures of what sort of research they're doing that's actually quite valuable to us now. 
And one of them was with the little mouse lemur, they're uh, nocturnal, right? Yes. And they hibernate. Yes. And uh, they were doing a lot of research with them to find out um, what would, how do they do that? How do they slow their whole bodily processes down, which could be valuable to space travel? Uh, if you've got a long voyage to Mars, it might be nice if humans, they could figure out how to, to uh, hibernate in a way. So there was a lot of interesting research that we couldn't find out from any other animal but lemurs. Are the Duke exhibits open to the public? I beg your pardon. Are the Duke exhibits open to the public? Yes. How do you explain the blue eyes? How do I explain the blue eyes? Um, the mother and the father had blue eyes. <laughs> Okay, uh, Preston, what is the diet of the lemur? The diet, what do they eat? It's vegetarian. Very vegetarian? Yes, yes. Just like monkeys, just like monkeys and apes. Okay, so anything berries, uh, what is it? Oh, well, berries are vegetarian. Yeah. <laughs> they eat what's in their Yes. Well, in captivity, they eat what we choose to feed them, uh, but that's all. It's all vegetarian. When you say that lemurs are most like us than any other, even the primates, are you saying their DNA is very similar to ours? I, I'm not sure the DNA is. The behavior and their um, endocrine system behavior is very much like us, um, just like female ruling. Uh. <laughs> Do they bite? Do they fight? Do they That's fight? A, that. Do they bite you? Oh, no. No. They don't? Well, I, I, I played with them for a year, and never got bitten. Uh, I'm, I think they can. They've got, certainly they've got teeth. They've got very sharp teeth. Yeah. But they're not aggressive. Preston, did you ever see uh, The Life of Pi or read The Life of Pi? No. Well, they had an island of, um, of animals. I don't know what they were called, but... Uh, I was wondering if they were related to the to the lemurs. I have Does no idea. Does anybody know about that island? That the, uh, I know the book, but I don't know the answer. Where is it located? It's it was in the uh, I guess in the Pacific. It was. Uh, <coughs> okay. Becky had a question. Okay, just we're going to I mean, you've got to do be out of time here shortly. How did you manage to sneak those lemurs out uh, on the plane? TSA didn't catch you or I, the members uh, were asleep? Or? <laughs> That's a great question, Becky. Um, I had made friends uh, with people in the American embassy, and they got me boarded safely uh, along with the lemurs. And then they had contacted uh, the people at uh, the um, airport in New York where I landed, and they knew I was coming uh, also with lemurs. So it worked out well. And uh, as it turned out, and this, that, that the, the woman at the embassy um, in Madagascar uh, ended up uh, being my first wife. <laughs> Preston, uh, these are these are babies, I think. But uh, do it? Do just the mothers care for them, or do the society mothers care for all of the young? Um, I think it's just the mothers. I do not. That's an excellent question, which I should know the answer to, but don't. All right, one more. Okay, Joan, you're the last. 
it's the silliest, but do they use their tail? That tail is so straight. Do they look like the monkey? And is it a support? They do not hang by their tails. Uh, they use their tails for balance, uh, as they're, and they're very adept at walking along thin branches and things of that sort. Uh, but they don't use their tails to hang or swing by. Okay, y'all, that's all the questions. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Don't run off unless you just want to, but there's about a eight or nine minute uh, YouTube video that shows the lemurs uh, being turned into the uh, woods at the Duke Center. So I'm, uh, I've, let me see if I can get that going for you. That is not a lemur. Hi, everybody. My name is Megan McGrath, and I'm the Education Programs Manager here at the Duke Lemur Center. Um, so I am about to head out with all of you into natural habitat enclosure number two. Um, now, I know some of you are just... Oh, Now, Preston, is this when they're turning them loose in the springtime? Yes. Yes. But they're very comfortable being in this 100-acre um, forest. They don't, they don't go off into South Carolina or, you know, <laughs> something like that. They're, they're, at, they're very comfortable. They're at home uh, here. It, it, it appears that different species get along well together. Absolutely. She has a baby on her back. I think the noise was the can. Uh, they do, a, they make squeals and barks. No, I, I, I can do Donald Duck, though. <laughs> Right over here, we have our other mentor. 
members of the task force are fast approved. We have a little bit of a disagreement over who can get to get out of this hole. That's because we have in the collar on the right side, Celia, who is the big sister to Lydia. And then we also have Dad and Rupert eating out of the same bowl. Now, Dad is usually at the bottom of the totem pole, but Rupert is really excited about his snack this morning. So he is working on trying to stand his ground to grab um, the carrot or the sweet potato. That's one of their favorite snacks that they get in their bowl. And then right over here, we have a little bit of thievery happening. Um, and that happens sometimes out in the forest. We don't worry too much about it. Just to check everybody's weight and make sure that they're doing okay throughout the summer as they're free ranging. So this is my favorite pair out here. Yes, even with a baby lemur out here. Um, this is Cardinal and Red Bay. They are red fronted lemurs. They are in their late 20s and they have been free ranging out in this particular habitat for years now. I think it's over a decade. Um, and this is a species that is sexually dichromatic. Um, so it is very easy to tell these two apart. Up top we have Red Bay. She is the female. You can see her facial coloration is a little different. And then, whoops, looks like Cardinal has decided to head over there and see what he can find. You can see his facial coloration is a little different, although he is facing away now. And now we have our ringtail lemur troop coming over to join the party. Um, so this is a troop that I'm not sure exactly who is who, but I can always confirm with our animal show staff after the fact. I do know that it includes uh, three girls, so over here we have Mom Sophia, and we had Narcissa and Nemesis, the twin girls, and then hanging out over on this side. Oh, nope, I misidentified already. We have two of our girls over here. Well, then that means that our guy Randy, there he is, is hanging out right under here. So Randy is currently hanging out in the front. He's about to do some scent marking behavior for you. Oh got two forms of scent marking. So the female, Ring Tail Lemur, was scent marking using a gland in her tail, and Randy is scent marking using a spur he has on the inside of his wrist that is unique to the males in the Ring Tail Lemur. So you can see that the cockle sophosphate is one of the more prized items out here. That is because our cockle sophos get a full diet of veggies every single day out in the forest. Most of our other lemurs just get their chow, which is a special primate food specifically formulated with everything they need because they have all kinds of things out in the forest that they can eat out, can eat out here. Just in this area alone, I can see some muscadine grapevine. Uh, we've got some honeysuckle vines that are growing through. There are mulberry trees out here, other berry bushes. So they have plenty that they can go ahead and eat. But the cockles of fox have a very special digestive system. So they have to get their full diet, a special type of polnivore primate chow, leaf-eating primate chow, every single day. And then they also get their full plate of veggies. Oh, saw another disagreement between father and daughter about who's going to get the treat. But let's come back over to what we're all excited to see. There's Gisella and little Diddy. Madagascar has an incredible amount of biodiversity. There are plants and animals, and of course mammals and the primates, the lemurs, found there that are found nowhere else in the world. So it's an incredibly special and unique place. And then the last reason is that lemurs are relatives of ours. Now they may be distant relatives in terms of the primate family tree, but they can tell us a lot about primate evolution, um, different primate characteristics. Lemurs have been separate from any other branch of the primate family tree for tens of millions of years. Their ancestors arrived on Madagascar over 50 million years ago and have been isolated 
ever since until humans arrived only within the last six or seven thousand years. So they're incredibly unique, incredibly important, and wonderful animals. Any, any other questions? That's a good question, Fred. Um, probably uh, eight to ten, eight to ten years, depending upon the species. Um, the uh, larger the species, I think, slightly greater, and the smaller, the less. Uh, What did they? Oh, um, I don't know. I didn't. Uh, I didn't see. Uh, the question was, what did they? How did they respond to the to the presence of a dog? Um, and um, I didn't didn't see. Sorry. The question is, what's the relationship of the? proportion of the ringtail lemur to the other species. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not sure that anybody knows that because they're so diverse on a huge, on the, on the huge island. And I'm sure they know that in Durham, <laughs> in Durham, but I don't know what it is specifically in Durham. They're certainly the most recognizable of the species because of the ring tail. So. Would it be a value to get one as a pet? <laughs> Is it possible to get one as a pet? I would say no. Okay. One more question. <laughs> no. You mean from one species to another? No. Super.